Okay, let's get started. Today we are wrapping up chapter three. Uh, we are going to do a little more material next week on simulations based on the end of chapter three. So essentially these ideas we've had all through the semester of how you create a bag of cards or something and you draw from them in order to gain intuition about how the p-values work, we can do that for the chi-square distribution stuff as well. And next week we're going to talk about how you do that. We'll do some examples. And, and also sort of wrap up chapter three that way. And then we're going to do a little bit of talking next week. It's really bright. Um, about the t-test. And there we go. And continuous distributions, because we haven't really touched on that a whole lot so far this semester. And that's for mainly the people who are done, who are finishing with 1051 and who aren't going on to next semester. For those who are going on to next semester, we're going to do that in full detail. It'll take four to six weeks. Um, but there's some people who are done after this class, and we would be remiss if we didn't at least introduce the topic so that they're aware that it exists. So today is the chi-squared test of independence or homogeneity, and we'll talk about what that means in about 30 minutes. But there's two different tests which are done exactly the same way, using exactly the same techniques, and the only thing that changes is the null hypothesis and the conclusion. So the inside guts of the problem is identical, but it's a test on a very subtly different thing. Identifying those different things is something that is important, and we've had put a couple of questions on the last assignment. So uh, general course announcements, things that are going on. Your lab exam starts Thursday. For most of you, you'll be done Thursday or Friday. There's one section who will go next week after that. Uh, the lab exam that you did on the dry run is very similar. If you study, there is no reason you can't do well. There is a single point on the lab exam, the 30th point out of 30, which requires that you do something we haven't explicitly done in workshop. I've given you all the tools you need to be able to do it, but we haven't shown you how to do one of these so far. You'll have to adapt. It is shading a histogram. And so if you look carefully at the rubric, the bottom right-hand corner, 5 out of 5 on the histogram, requires that you shade the histogram. Now again, I've given you all the techniques and all the functions that you need to be able to do this, but I haven't shown you this. This is to differentiate between people who really have done the work and deserve a perfect on a lab exam and those who get only a 97. So if you don't get that or you don't care to get that, it's one point out of 30. So that's there, but you have some time to still figure it out. And you, you know, if somebody figures it out and you want to ask them how it works, that's totally fine. Again, you're studying, you're preparing. On the lab exam, though, uh, everything proceeds as it did on the dry run. You get 90 minutes. You will have a rubric handed to you on paper with the exam on the back. It'll be a dual-sided photocopied piece of paper. You will sign that piece of paper and hand it in, and I will mark your handed in work onto the piece of paper. So you have to hand it in. It's a, it's a combo of attendance and a way for me to kind of have a set of papers and I'll mark each section at a time. Uh, that's going to take a while. Don't expect it back in two or three days or anything ridiculous. There's 600 almost of these things that we have to get through. It's going to take some time. So you'll get it back, you know, you get your grades back for that sometime before the final, but no guarantees that it'll be much before the final. In terms of schedule for the course, uh, the other professor created a lovely document which goes through everything that's currently going on in the course and how we're ramping up to the end. I posted it on Slack and Blackboard last night. I sent out an announcement to your email, you probably got it. Basically just goes through, okay, this is the assignment, this is when it's due, this is what it covers, that's the last assignment. This is the quiz, it's due tomorrow, it's the last quiz. Lab exam is happening, you know, all this kind of stuff. Just to set you in your place for the course, essentially as of Friday, the majority of you will be done everything except the final. Because the, the final assignments due the following Monday, but you may already be done it. And so you could be literally done everything for this course except the final exam as of Friday this week. And we've got a little more time, we're going to talk about a little bit more stuff, but that's the last of the actual deliverables and the marks. In terms of office hours, I have an office hour today. I have two hours of office hour tomorrow, the usual time slots. In addition, two of the TAs have volunteered to hold a special lab exam office hour tomorrow evening. So that will run, I believe, from 5 to 7. I will confirm that, and then I will post an announcement. But if you want to go get some last-minute help or you want to figure something out and you just want to talk to somebody in person, you can go tomorrow night to do that. Question, yes? You can write whatever you want. You could write a novel in there if you wanted to. 
the great Canadian novel can go into your cheat sheet. I don't care what you put in it. The only rules are it has to be an R Markdown or R Script file that lives inside our studio. It's not a PDF. It's not you pulling up the PDFs of the workshops as you try and work through the lab exam. It's one pre-written file in our studio. Put whatever you want in it. And yes, I do fully expect you all to put your dry run solution in there. You'd be silly not to, given that I've given it to you and I've told you it's very similar. You know, just don't copy paste it all and then be confused why it doesn't quite work. Obviously, there will be subtle differences between your dry run and the real one, and you need to actually know enough to be able to adapt it. Any other questions about course organization, that sort of thing? No? All right, then let's wrap up the theory of chapter three. Chi-square test of independence or homogeneity. So summary, this is kind of a, this is the whole, everything we've done so far to set where we are in the course. So if you're doing categorical variables, there are a bunch of different options you have. You can have a single sample with two possible outcomes. That's a binary decision. That's where you know it can be either true or false, or you, you support the privatization of puppies, or you don't, or whatever you wanted to come up with as an example. In that case, we would do test of hypotheses for single proportions, and we would compare the sample data with some sort of assumed underlying population truth, like our survey of who supports the Liberal Party in the dry run of the exam, or whatever else you can come up with. There's lots of cases. And then we can do confidence intervals on the same. If we had two samples of categorical variables, again, with two possible outcomes, then we have two proportions. And then we do a test on two proportions, and we can do a hypothesis test and a confidence interval for the same. If we have a single sample of a categorical variable, and it has many possible outcomes, where many is more than two, but less than you know, a million, some small countable number of things, then that is last week's content, and that was tests of goodness of fit. And so we have a distribution which describes the proportions of each category of the categorical variable. They add up to one, and you can do a test to see if your data matches that fit. And so the example we closed off with last lecture was Benford's Law, which was this law named after a 19th century physicist that essentially says that distribution of numbers, you get more ones than twos, more twos than threes, and more of them than nines. And you have this decaying sort of relationship in randomly selected numbers. Now, today, we end up with the last two things. So if you have a single sample, like last week, where we have a sample of uh, finance charges, which we were looking at for fraud, something like that, but instead of categorizing it by one categorical variable, and adding up with a bunch of bins. We categorize it by two variables. So in a survey, say I asked, you know, I'm doing a survey and I'm getting your opinion on the privatization of puppies and as my way of trying to add and subtract through the data, I ask you, what's your gender? And I consider that to be binary, male, female. And I ask, what's your income strata? And so, you, you know, this is your family income, and so it's, you know, is your family income less than $30,000 a year, thirty dollars to $50,000 a year, fifty to $70,000, and so on. So two things that I've asked you, two answers you've given me, which allow me to place you into one specific bin in a two-way table. It's now rows and columns. And then I take your, your results and I put you in where you belong. And so that is the categorization of a variable by two, but it's one sample. So I've just taken one sample from the class and I've asked you these categorical variables and then I've, I've added up how many I have of each case. That is a test of independence because then what I'm trying to determine is whether the, the variable that I'm assigning to the columns is related to the variable I'm assigning to the rows. And that's a test of independence. If I do the exact same thing, but I take one variable and then I survey multiple populations. So say I took all of the female students in this class and I asked you a question which categorized you, maybe income. I took all the female students and I asked your income. And then I took all the male students and I sampled from you and I asked your income. That's no longer a test of independence. That is a test of homogeneity. And it makes the same kind of table and the same kind of test, and the same process, but what you're testing is subtly different. 
So the rest of today's lecture is going through the differences between these two. And this sets you in a framework. These are all of the hypothesis tests from the entire semester. And so sort of one thing I didn't announce, I have posted that review assignment I promised a few weeks ago. It is every single question that I have asked you so far in this course, except the ones that are still due for Mercs. So I'll add quiz 9 and assignment 10 to that as soon as they're actually due and done. And then you'll have every question from the course, and we are going to create the exam from those questions. So and it's up, and you have an infinite number of attempts. So you can spend as much time as you want doing stats during the exam period to study. And you'll have questions that you can try, and it'll tell you if you did them right or wrong. Off and on, yes. Uh, maybe not quite. So the question was, will we still be on Slack? We'll still be around. I may not be there every day, <laughs> just because I, I have to mark your lab exams in there somewhere, and that's going to take like a week. So I'll be disappearing for that week. But no, we'll still be around, and we'll still hold regular office hours. And I believe mascot. Guys, is true. We're, mascot's going to do the day before tea and study yeah, thing. Ask if I can about that actually. Yes. Okay. Sky's going to make it a quick announcement. Just, just tell them about it. Hi guys. I'm one of your TAs. Um, so uh, we're going to kind of run this tutorial on the 13th from two to five in the science complex in room 203, which is like a, a small little lecture room. And so there's going to be David's tea there and uh, Tim Hortons and all kinds of refreshments and stuff. And you guys, can you come and ask us questions? And we can go through problems. We'll announce that again closer to, so you don't worry about trying to get it scribbled down. But yeah. there will be that. Uh, Dr. Boo and I will also hold office hours. Like, we, we are around. It's not as if, you know, the end of the semester comes and we're just like, good luck. Can we throw you off? We see you again on your exam. We will be around. It's just, obviously, we're going to try and schedule it so that, you know, we're only doing the studying and office hours like one or two days a week. I can't meet with students every single day of the week or I lose all my time and then I can't get anything done. And I have all this marking to do. So, okay, today we're going through these last two topics and we're going to try and finish chapter three. So here's the way we summarize. A two-way table, it's called, because you have rows and you have columns. That is two ways of categorizing your data. Whether it comes from two different samples or multiple samples, or whether it comes from just two ways of describing an individual person, they're summary tables. And they display frequencies. Now, frequency is a word that we used way back at the start of the term. We haven't used it a lot lately. This just means counting. So if I go through the class and I add up every single person in the class who has blonde hair and is also female, that is a frequency. If I then do the same for males, I have the other element that goes in the blonde hair column of my table. And I can do the same for redheads and brunettes and so on. And I can categorize you all by the color of your hair. The numbers represent the summaries of the variables whose values are the categories. And this is across the rows and columns. So there will be one variable which describes this way across the columns and one variable which describes this way, which is down the rows. Two variables. We will again use a chi-squared test to do the exploration of whether the relationship between these two things is statistically significant. So here's our motivating example, though, like what we've been using all along. So popular kids. Uh, there's a data set called popular that comes with uh, open intro. And students in grades four to six were asked whether good grades, that's one option, athletic ability, second option, or popularity, third option, was most important to them in their little kid life. You know, these, these are 10 year olds, 11 year olds. A two way table which organized them by the grade of the student who responded and which one they chose as being their most important thing is given there. And then we've done a mosaic plot. Remember, we talked about those briefly back in chapter one to kind of display what's going on. And so you can see what seems to happen is that roughly, like all things kind of just roughly, they look like they're about the same across the different categories. There's some variation there. And maybe sports goes down as you get older, but it's, it's pretty subtle, right? There's nothing really standing out. And so the question is, do these data provide evidence to suggest that the goals vary by grade. Now notice that. That's all you get. You don't get an indication of how they vary, why they vary, 
You can't generalize. It simply tells you that the goals are different grade to grade. That's it. That's all you're testing for. So the hypotheses are, because we did one survey of a big set of primary students, we didn't specifically go to the grade fours and ask them, and then the grade fives and then ask them. We just asked, and they said, oh, I'm in grade four, and I like think sports are the best. And I'm in grade six, and I think grades are super important because I want to be a doctor. Whatever, right? No, you ask them and they got it. So our null hypothesis is that there's nothing going on. There is no relationship. That's what it's been all along. And so if there's no relationship, that means the variables are independent. In other words, your opinion about the most important of these three categories in your life does not depend upon, is not influenced by the grade you are in. And the alternative is that, obviously, the opposite of that, they are dependent, and which grade you're in influences how you feel. Now, obviously, this is grades four to six. <laughs> it's not like your opinion changes a whole lot in that age. You're kind of still just, you know, a preteen. You know, if you ask a grade four versus a university student, you might get a subtly different response. All of a sudden, sports are almost irrelevant, because we all know we're not going to be pro sports stars, except for, like, the one in a thousand of us. And everybody else is like, you know, I think grades are probably fairly important at this point. Popularity, I can live without. Grades, let me get my job. Let me have a life, so on. So that's the hypotheses. These are always the hypotheses for a test of independence. And the way you tell that it's a test of independence, and we're going to go over this until you're bored with it, is that it's one sample. I took one sample, and the responses then allowed me to categorize that one sample. If I'd taken more than one sample, that's when it becomes a test of homogeneity. And we'll talk about what the hypotheses are for that in a bit. So the test statistic is exactly the same setup as we did last week for the goodness of fit. It's O minus E, all squared over E. And I had a few people on Slack asking questions about this where it didn't quite seem to click how this worked. Just remember these E's, you do not round these. You keep at least one decimal, preferably two, just because it does change the chi-squared test statistic quite a bit if you start rounding them, and it's enough to kind of make it look like you did it wrong. Especially to web work, which doesn't have a lot of you know, ability to go, oh, they almost did it right, let's give them the points. It's kind of go, nope, you're off by too much, you're wrong. As you've all seen, I'm sure, this semester. So don't round those. Now, the difference here is I've, I've included a summation notation and all the rest of it. The key here is that we ha don't just have a row. It's not like goodness of fit where we just go across and we do all the E's and then we did O minus E and then we add up. We have to do that for all the rows. So you have to go down the rows as well as across the columns. You need an E value for every single cell. And for those of you who've completed assignment nine, which I think is basically everybody at this point, it was due a couple days ago or yesterday, doing just one goodness of fit was pretty tedious, right? If you do it by hand, just wait till you have to do it for a whole table. And you have to do an expected value for every single cell. And then you do the O minus E squared over E for each cell, and then you add those up. And that's what the that formula says. Now, you know what the goodness of fit? We added degrees of freedom. And that would describe the degrees of freedom of our chi squared. That was one less than the number of cells. So if you had six categories, your degrees of freedom were five. When we're dealing with a two-way table, it doesn't work quite the same way. It's one less than the number of columns times one less than the number of rows. And that's what these are. So R is the number of rows, and C is the number of columns. So if you have a table that's 3 by 4, you have 2 by 3, or 6 degrees of freedom. It's very important you get that right, or obviously, again, it throws off your p-values, and your answers become a little bit silly. So that's our setup. Do note, again, to calculate the degrees of freedom differently, the p-value, again, for this test is an upper-tailed, one-tailed p-value. It is the area from your test statistic to the right, which in R, we talked about last week, is done exactly the same way. We use, just like we did for normals, we used p-norm. For chi-squareds, we use p-chi-square. And so this is a p-chi-square again. And there's two options. You can either say upper tail is true, 
um, or our lower tail is false, and you can send it that way, or you can just do one minus like you did in the P norm case, and that works as well. Whichever you're more comfortable with is totally fine. And on the exam, if I ask you to write down what code would you put into R to get this P value, I'll accept both. That's totally fine. I understand that both work. And that's one of the nice and also terrifying things about R is that there's usually seven different ways to do any given thing. And you can do whichever way you want. And that means that there's a lot of um, non-overlapping Venn diagrams in, in sort of domain-specific knowledge where I know how to do something and so do you, but we don't know the same method. And that can make it difficult to talk about, as I'm sure you've sort of bumped into when the TAs try and show you their favorite method and it's not the method on the sheet. And that's just the way programming goes. All right, so let's work our way through this. We need the observed and expected values for every single cell. The observed is obviously easy. That's always given to you. Without that, you can't do the problem. The expected, on the other hand, it takes a bit of work. Now, this is the formula. To get this formula working, you actually need some extra stuff. You have to compute these totals and these totals. They typically are not given to you in every problem. So you have to find them first so that you can then take the formula and get the expected values. So we take the row total corresponding to the cell that we're looking at. We take the column total of the cell that we're looking at. And we divide it by the grand or table total, which is this guy down here. So if I wanted to do, and that's the next slide, the first one, so row one, column one, I would take the fourth row, fourth grade and grades. That's where I'm looking at. So I'm looking at this 63 right now. So this is the first row and the first column, which means I identify the first row, first column. Those are my three numbers. And I put those together by multiplying the 119 by the 247 and dividing by 478. And that gets me my expected value for the first of nine cells. Do it again. So I have 119 again, but I end up with 141 this time, and so on. Now, I have rounded these, and that's very bad of me, so don't be like me. I don't know what I was thinking when I made these slides. So here's a quick practice for you. The 55, what's this expected? So we have the 55, so it should use this and this. And so do we take 176 and 141 and divide by 478? So it's not this guy, it's not this guy, and it's not that guy, so it's the first one. It's not hard, it's just incredibly tedious. And if you make one mistake, it throws off the whole problem. So you just have to go slow and careful. And at least for the web work, I do recommend just kind of, you can do it all in, in R as well. And I'm going to show you how to do that today. It's a way of kind of, I would recommend doing at least a few of these by hand to prepare for the final, because you have to use your calculator on the final. But also I'm going to show you how to do it really quickly in R. And that'll let you check your work to make sure you just submit the right answer in web work. And you don't, if you have a typo, it lets you catch your own typo. So it is indeed 52. Again, don't be like me. Don't round this guy. So this gets us all of our expected values. We've turned through. We now have nine expected values, nine observed values. The next part is even more tedium. We take all the O's. We subtract all the E's. We square the results. We then divide each of the results by their respective E's. And this is where the, the rounding really kicks in, is if you've rounded at this point, it's going to throw off the chi-squared. And it can throw it off by a couple of points, actually. I've seen people uh, sending me messages on Slack who've already started the assignment, especially from the other section. And you know, the, their chi-squared test statistic can be off by two or three. Like it's like 17.2, and it should have been 15.9. So those rounding really does make a big difference to what the chi-squared actually is. So putting this all together. Start adding it up. So we take the top left one and we take 63. We subtract 61. We square the results. We divide by 61. 
We take 31 minus 35. We square it. We divide by 35. The dot, dot, dot is all of the rest of the junk because we're not doing all nine of these on the slide. And then the last one is the bottom right, 32 minus 34, all squared over 34. Work your way through. Find each of these. If you do it in R, you can create a line for each one, save them as variables, and then just add all the variables up. I've seen a lot of people doing that, and that's a great way to kind of be able to find your typo when inevitably you make one. So if you do it on the calculator, you then have to go back through them all, which is sort of annoying. And then the final answer is 1.3121. The degrees of freedom is one less than the number of rows, one less than the number of columns multiplied together. So 3 minus 1 times 3 minus 1 is 2 times 2 is 4. So we have four degrees of freedom, and that's our chi-squared test statistic. And then to conclude this, you conclude it in the same way we did last week and the way we've been doing for six weeks. You find the p-value, and you make your decision based on the size of that p-value. There are lots of ways to find p-values. We talked last week about how to use R. You could use the back of the, you could use a table. I don't think you should, <laughs> but you could. It's theoretically possible. This is what a chi-squared distribution looks like with that test statistic indicated. Do we reject the null here without me even telling you the p-value? Is this a reject the null case? Chi-squared tests are upper-tailed tests. This is not even remotely in the upper tail. This is a p-value of like 0.7. So it is not small at all. The rejection region's up here. It needs to be really tiny to reject, and it's not. So we plug this in and we say p chi square of q being 1.3121 with four degrees of freedom. And we say, no, don't do lower tail, do upper tail. That's what this means. And the result is a p-value of 0.859. Now again, I've had some feedback on this, like people saying they still don't understand this, that somehow it hasn't clicked. You take your p-value and you compare it to alpha. If alpha is not specified, you always use 0.05. So that, that part at least is pretty clear. People understand they should do that. It's which comparison is which that people don't seem to quite get, some people. So the idea is this. If p is smaller than alpha, this means your p area is small, which means it's out in the tail which means it's far from the null. And in that case, if you're a long way away from the null, that says, oh, the null's here, and we're way out here. Those aren't very similar. So I'm going to reject the null hypothesis. Question? As I've said multiple times, no. I will not be giving you table of values. I've never shown you how to use them. I think they're stupid. They will not be on your final. So again, uh, and this is again on this, this review sheet for telling you what's going on in the course, we are going to post the equation sheet slash equivalent lookup table that you're going to be using on the exam. And what it's going to consist of is a small subset of p norm, q norm calls and p quite squared Q chi squared calls, and you just go, well, I wanted a P norm with this, you know, this setup. Uh, there it is. That would be what R would tell me. I'm going to use that in my problem. And it's, it's kind of just my way of working around the fact that you don't have a laptop. So I've taught you how to do it in R. I expect in the future, if you ever have to do stats, you'll do it in R. So why would I do anything else on the exam? So that's the idea. So in this case, we reject. Now, is this true? No, our p is really big. Our p is definitely not small. It is not smaller than 0.05. It is not 0.01 or 0.001 or 1 times 10 to the minus 37, as we get with some of these examples on web work. That means we fail to reject. So that's our conclusion. So we do not have evidence to reject the null, which means we do not conclude that the values or goals of these students vary by the grade that they're in. In other words, the two variables are independent, at least as far as we can tell. Conclusion. 
Null hypothesis was that they're independent. The goals do not vary by grade. Uh, P was big. I said greater than 0.3, but it was just kind of like, it's big. We do not have a small p. We cannot reject the null. We fail to reject the null hypothesis. And the data do not provide convincing evidence that the grade and goals are dependent. It does not appear that the goals vary by the grade, which is what our mosaic plot hinted at at the start. We would have been surprised if it said anything else. But sometimes our intuition doesn't really track, and so it's good to always check. So that is a two-way chi-squared test of independence. That's 90% of assignment 10. It's just doing that repeatedly until you're bored with it. And that's actually the last topic for the final exam. The rest of today, I'm just going to do more examples. So again, there are two tests. We talked about this at the start, which is the test for homogeneity and the test for independence. And which one you use depends on the collection of the data. So if I do one survey, one sample, and I create a two-way table from it, that's a test for independence. If I do multiple surveys or multiple samples, and I create a table using that and the one question I asked everybody, that's the other way. That's the test for homogeneity. So a test for homogeneity collects two or more independent samples from multiple populations, assign every response you get a categorical variable that keeps track of who you asked. So this is a female response, this is a male response, this is a Canadian response, this is an American response, this is a British response, or so on. You keep track of where you got it, and you've asked them one thing. One categorical question. And this creates a table where you have the categorical question you asked and where you got the data. And then, by opposition, the test for independence is just one sample that you then break up and slice and dice into two different ways. So having said that, you, you do need to be able to distinguish between them because it changes which hypothesis you write down, which is usually worth points. Now, homogeneity is a weird word, but just tear it apart. Homo homogeneous milk, homogeneous milk, you can buy that. Homogeneity just means sameness. And so it is a test for sameness. It's the test for whether the different populations you sampled from are the same. So I, if I sample from redheads and blondes and brunettes and so on, and I ask them a question about, I don't know, pain tolerance, and then I ask whether they are the same. Are those populations the same with respect to how they respond to this question, or not. And that's your null hypothesis versus alternative. So here's some examples. Quick check to see if you actually were paying attention and know how this works now. It's not a very complicated concept, but still. So if I collect a large sample of people and then I write down their marital status and income, what test is that? Independence. If I collect a big sample of male and female opinions on global warming, what test is that? Homogeneity. I have collected from two different populations. And I ran out of space there. If we conduct a large survey on undergraduate students at Trent, independence. If I conduct a large survey on undergraduate students across Ontario, Still independence, still one survey. If I conduct a large survey of undergraduate students in Ontario by doing a survey at McMaster and a survey at Trent and a survey at Toronto and a survey at Waterloo, what do I have? Homogeneity. And that's really all there is to it for deciding between them. You just have to look at it and go, did they take multiple smaller surveys or did they take a big survey? And it changes which test it is, changes nothing about the guts, just the statement of the hypothesis and the statement of the conclusion, because it subtly affects how you say the words. In both cases, we're interested in knowing the same thing. Are they related or not? It uses the same test statistic, the same formula, the same p-value. Only the hypothesis and the statement of the conclusion change. So here's some examples, more, more thorough examples than just those little ones. So the GSS. 
Ask this question. There are always some people whose ideas are considered bad or dangerous. Uh, for instance, someone who is against churches and religion. If such a person wanted to give a speech in Peterborough against churches, should he be or she be allowed to speak or not? And then respondents were also asked about their income and categorized in number of thousands of dollars per year of income and their response of allowed and not allowed. And then the responses are summarized in this table. What sort of test would we do? This is a test for independence again. We did one survey. We asked them two things. How much money do you make? And are you for or against free speech, essentially, in an American sense? And then we wrote it down. And then we were interested in whether how much money you make, as we move across here, affects whether you approve or don't approve of the idea of allowing an anti-theist to speak. What about this one? Uh, the journal Obesity, which is part of the Lancet family, um, analyzed data from the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health, defined as having a body mass index of 30, and the research subjects were followed for, I guess, about a decade uh, between adolescence and adulthood. And then the people were categorized in terms of their relationship status. So were they dating? Were they cohabitating? Or had they gotten married? And then they just tracked their BMIs as well. And the question was whether there was a relationship between these two things. So again, what kind of test is this? Independence. It's one set of people, and they were categorized then on the basis of their BMI and the basis of their relationship status. So they, just, they did a follow-up survey, essentially, of some people that they had categorized in their adolescence. This is, again, you would do a test of independence. So the relationship or the requirements are the same. The hypotheses, if you state them in a generalized sense, are also the same. The null hypothesis is that there's nothing going on, there's nothing to see, move along, which means there's no relationship to talk about. These two things are unrelated. And the alternative is that there is a relationship. So if on the exam I give you a two-way table and you just blank completely and you cannot remember how this works, that's the generic hypothesis that works for both. And you can just put that down. It may not get you full marks, but it'll get you at least half marks, because at least you knew that much. What's required? We need independent observations. That's what we need all along. We've needed randomness all semester, so that's not so surprising. And this was a multiple choice question in the last week. We need expected frequencies to be greater than or equal to 5. We do not need our observed values to be greater than or equal to 5. That's important, because they don't have to be. And in fact, in cases where there's actually a divergence from your goodness of fit or from your independence argument, you will get zeros in some of the cells. You get people who just don't support something on a certain income strata, and then you will get zeros. And that's fine so long as you would expect at least five people in that category, given the totals of the rows and the columns. So if you're checking things, it's about the expected values, not the observed. When you have this set up, that statistic follows the chi-squared distribution. Row minus one, column minus one, multiply them together. That's your degrees of freedom. Do the process just like we've done in our example already. All right, here's another thing from the GSS. Uh, is a person's level of education related to their marital status? So there's a random sample of 924 adults, 18 and older which measures the married status or marital status of each. Are they married in common law, divorced, widowed, or single? And also ask these people their highest level of attained education. Did they finish high school? Did they finish college? Did they finish university? Or did they finish graduate school? And it's how far they'd gotten. Actually, how far had they finished? You all would not qualify at the moment as anything but high school because you're still in university. And you, you know, it'll take another couple of years probably until you finish. And then you'll be in that other category. And then we wrote them all down. And so we had, for example, in the common law category, there are 23 people from this survey of 924 total adults who are 
high school grads, 32 college grads, and so on. You see what I mean about the zeros, though? We have no people from the 924 college, university, or graduate school graduates who are currently divorced. People who are single, sure, but nobody who was divorced. And that can mean all kinds of things, and you, you can't generalize just from the data, but it is showing up that zeros can show up. And that's OK, so long as the expected values in that cell is not less than or equal to 5. So in this case, because again, it's a single random sample, we would do a test for independence. We're actually going to do this one. But instead of doing it all by hand and working our way through and all the rest of it, we are going to do this analysis in R. So this is how you would do it. So the first thing I do is I have to create the table. You have to keep track of the rows and columns and all that. So I have to create the table. So to do that, I create a matrix. And this we did, I think, in week six, five or six. We did matrices in the workshops. So you take a big vector. That's what this is. This is a, a vector, a C vector, that runs all the way down here and loops around the next row. This is a vector of the data where the order absolutely matters. And this is by row. So this is the top row, then the second row, then the third row, then the fourth row. And that's why I turned on by row. I'm saying put this data back in the matrix form by filling it in across the rows, please. Don't put it down the columns, because that's not how I recorded it. And then I say we've got five rows and four columns. That's the size of our thing. And I create that, and I save it as the variable educ, or education. And then I say, do a chi-square.test. And it's like, OK. And it gives me the answer. This is what I was saying. You can very easily check your chi-square test statistic and p-values in R. And you can even just do this if you just want to blast through assignment 10 and not really learn anything. But for the exam, you do need to be able to find the expected values. It's worth practicing a little bit. And so we do a Pearson chi-squares test. And it gives me my chi-squared or x-squared value. This is chi-squared test. The value is 349. Is that a large chi-squared test? In our limited amount of experience, you know, all of a week and a bit. Yeah, that's kind of big. It's not 10, it's not 12, it's 300. We're expecting this to be way out in the tail. And then our p-value is so small that R can't keep track of it anymore. And it's just like, yeah, it's small. I don't know what it is, but it's really, really, really small. So if we were to put this into web work, this would be your test statistic that it would ask for. And it's actually usually asked for the chi-squared. And then you would say your p-value is zero. Remember, for the p-values in web work, I always set them to round. I give you the correct you know, tick off if you're within like 0.01 or 0.001. So if it's that small, that's 0 0.00000000000, 16 zeros, and then a two. Round that to the nearest thousandth. It's zero. So you just put zero in, and then it goes, oh, yeah, you're, you're close. And then it just gives it to you. Because once we're that small, it's kind of irrelevant how small we are. So it's a single sample, two measurements per object, and it's a test of independence, as we said on the last slide. And our p-value is extremely small in this case. So we do have evidence at any kind of level you want to talk about. And we reject this null hypothesis. So what was the null hypothesis? The null hypothesis is that there's nothing going on. There's no relationship. The variables are independent. So let's go back up. Level of education attainment and marital status are not independent. This does not mean that people with more education have happier, more fulfilling relationships. This does not mean they are better people. This does not mean any of the generalization you can come up with. It means that the pattern of breakdown of relationship status is different depending on your current level of attained education. And this could purely be 
You know, if all you have is a high school education and you are in a relationship, you are much more likely to have been divorced than any of the other categories. But that can mean all kinds of things. I mean, you got married really young and it was a mistake or anything you want to talk about. Whereas in this case, we have that the vast majority of people with a graduate degree are just married. Does that mean that their relationships are better and they stay married? No, it just means they're older. They finished grad school. They're at minimum 24, maybe 26, depending on, you know, 30 if you have a PhD, right? They're older. Therefore, they're more likely to be married. That can be entirely what's going on here. It doesn't have to be some sort of value judgment. But all we get to say from our chi-square test is that the variables are not independent. There is a difference in pattern across these variables. That's it. That's all you get. So do be very careful. One of the things we're going to try and trick you on is give you some value judgment as a conclusion in a multiple choice and be like, is this the correct answer? And you have to be like, no, I can't say that. I don't have that much information. All I can say is that they're different, not what the difference is. So there is a relationship. We don't know what it is, but the relationship exists. And that's the end of that example. So drawbacks, this is what I've been saying. It only reveals whether they are related, not what the relationship is. If you are in a case where you only have two categories in the columns and two categories in the rows, and you have a two by two table, then you can actually, in that case, do it using a two proportion Z test, because you've actually just got two proportions. Take one of the variables as your proportion, the other one just gives you P1 and P2. And you can actually break it back into a two proportion test like chapter 3.2. And you can do that, which does give you the ability to tell that one of them is greater than the other or less than the other. But in general, as soon as you're up to three categories, you cannot tell what's going on. And that is one of the downsides to these more complex statistics. And you will, for those of you going on to 1052, you will see this next semester again. At the end of chapter four, there's a topic called ANOVA analysis of variance, where it has exactly the same drawback. It can tell you if a bunch of means are different, but not which one or how, just that they are. All right, here's a slightly more um, topical, maybe, example. For those of you who are aware of the Jenny McCarthy brand of pseudoscientific bullshit that exists in the world, um, vaccines cause autism. Ooh. All right, so as you can tell, I think it's bullshit. <laughs> I've actually looked at the stats, so I have some justification for my extremely strong stance on what I'm saying here. But here's the question. Does the MMR, measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine, cause autism spectrum disorder, or ASD? In other words, does giving your infant, one-year-old, two-year-old, the MMR vaccine then cause them to develop autism when they didn't have it already? Now, this all largely came out of, um, historically, a paper that was published in Lancet, to their everlasting shame, by a man who used to be called Dr. Andrew Wakefield. He's no longer doctor because he had his medical license revoked for that paper because he falsified the data and he published a thing which made it look like it was statistically significant relationship between MMR and autism spectrum and that giving your kids MMR had a small chance of giving them autism, which immediately led to, as I said, Jenny McCarthy level pseudoscientific bullshit and people just freaking out despite the fact that the introduction of vaccines are one of the single greatest things to happen in human history. Look around you, look to your left, look to your right. Without vaccines, one of those people would be dead. That's the difference between pre-vaccine and post-vaccine. If you ever want something that's sort of incredibly sad and also sort of uplifting at the same time, go to an old cemetery, like I'm talking 1850s circa, where the, the tombstones have survived, and look at the family plots. You'll have the mother and the father and three to five infant children. That's what we used to have. Infant mortality and childbirth deaths used to be significant 
And that's part of the reason people had such big families, is because you knew you would lose at least a child, possibly two. Whereas now, if you think about it, you probably barely know one person in your immediate family of uh, friends and family who've lost an infant. We still have children die, there's still accidents, but to lose an infant to an infant mortality sickness is almost unheard of now. That's because of vaccines, primarily. So, it's a good thing. It keeps us from getting polio, which is not a nice thing. It keeps us from getting measles and mumps, which used to kill people. So, does it cause autism though? That's the trade-off. And even if it did, is it worth it? And that's the question we would have to ask as a society. But first, let's answer the question. Does it cause this? Are they related? So here is a new study. This is not the Wakefield study. This is a more recent study, which was done, which gave these children the study, and they had experienced a gastrointestinal GI event, as a side, which is a common side effect of the MMR. And so they investigated when the ASD symptoms began, and if their onset was related to when the child received it. And so this was actually published in, I think, Gastroenterology, which is, a, again, a medical journal, where they were kind of focusing on that as a marker for trying to keep track of when they'd actually been given the vaccine in a data set where they didn't actually have good records. So we have a little two-way table, and there's not a whole lot going on. We don't have a lot of samples, but we have 12 children who received the MMR before having a gastrointestinal event, and then 12 of those children developed autism spectrum disorder, and then three did not. And then the, of the children who received MMR after, after a gastrointestinal event, and then so on. Now, what you can see from this table right away is that obviously they've zoomed in on an area of the population. How many people, what percentage of the population have autism? Anybody have any sort of ideas about the proportions? I mean, it's autism spectrum, right? It's a spectrum disorder. So you can have people who are extremely high functioning and have almost none of the symptoms, but are still just barely on the spectrum. And commonly, you know, people with Asperger's syndrome are considered to be sort of just barely on that spectrum. And then you can have non-functioning people. They can't, they can't speak, they can't read or write, they can't communicate in any way, they're essentially locked in. And that's, that's sort of on the far end. So that's the spectrum. What percentage of the population do you think actually is on that spectrum? Guess. Somebody guesses five, four. It's under four. It's not anywhere near as high as some people would try and make it feel. In fact, it, it may, depending on how you define it, be as low as 1% or lower. And that's everybody on the spectrum, including all the awkward kids who are perfectly able to, to you know, learn to, to communicate and live in the modern society versus the, the children who desperately need help because they can't. You know, they're actually so far on the spectrum that they can't even communicate. And, and people have this mental picture of autism as being the, like the worst thing ever because you immediately go to locked-in syndrome. And actually, it's a spectrum, right? And, 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 and some people are, are able to be perfectly functioning adults, and some people aren't. And that's what you have to worry about is that far end. So it's actually really low. So why do we have 15 out of you know, 27 or whatever? It's because we're already looking at a population that's kind of in this framework. High risk factors and all the rest of it. So, we're doing a two-way table test. We're interested in whether these two things are related. So our null hypothesis is that the onset of the symptoms is independent of when you receive the MMR vaccine. In other words, the MMR vaccine doesn't cause autism any more than autism causes the MMR vaccine. We'll get to that in a minute. And then the alternative is that the onset is related. In other words, there's a relationship. We don't know that it's causal, but there's something going on there that deserves more study. And so, the researchers in this paper did the same thing we we're going to do. They created a little matrix. They plugged it into R or SAS or STATA or something, and they got a chi-squared test statistic. And then they found a p-value of 0 0.1359. This is not a small number. This is a medium number. It is not less than 0.05. It is not less than 0.01. It is not exceptional. So we fail to reject the null. The conclusion of this is that there's no evidence for a relationship between MMR and ASD. One more piece of evidence in this 20-year battle to overturn the public relations fiasco of having published a really horrible paper that caused people to go crazy. It's when you actually, yes. So when we reject the null, 
is when we end up with a small p-value, which means we're far out in the tail, which means the result that we have obtained is exceptional under the assumption of the null, which means it's probably not true that the null, the null happened and this happened at the same time. It would be like, I have a fair coin, I say. And then I flip that coin 20 times and I get 20 heads. And you're like, hold on a minute, something's going on. That's essentially what happens every time we reject the null. Is that the null says, this is the way it is, and then you get a result and you're like, that's like a one in a thousand chance. How did that happen if that's true? I'm going to reject you. No. In this case, we have 0 0.1359, 13%. We kind of look at that, we're like, eh. That's not really small. I mean, it's not really big either, but it's like it's not exceptional. That would be if I flipped 50 coins and, you know, I, I flipped like seven heads and 43 tails. It's weird, but it's not enough for you to go, whoa, 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 let me see the other side of that coin kind of thing, which is what you get when you get a really, really small P. You're saying that doesn't match the null. Question? Ah, very good question. Thank you. When you are doing a smaller test, there is a correction for continuity that is introduced that we're not going to talk about in class, which will add this extra corrected by blah, 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 and it changes the chi-squared test statistic for that correction. For your purposes, for this course, for 1051, always, you can either always say that or just always say that when you have a smaller table that only has two dimensions in any of the axes. You can just always say it if you want. You never want to correct for continuity because we just haven't talked about what it means. Down the road, when you're starting to do your honors theses and so on, when you get smaller table sets, we can talk about it then. And you'll have the context to actually know why it's something you need to worry about. But for now, we're just going to pretend it doesn't exist. Question? Oh, absolutely. It just won't do anything in that case because it's not going to try and correct. It only does it when there's two dimensions in one of the axes, like two rows or two columns. And so if you have three by three or bigger, you can just drop it. But if you want to just put it in all the time for the purposes of this one assignment, and I won't, I won't mark you down on the exam if you forget to put that parameter. It's knowing that you should call chi-square.test is kind of about the level of what I expect. All right, so we failed to reject. So let's kind of talk about this a little bit more. Um, so this is a, oh, it dropped it. If you grab the HTML version of the slides, I've actually got the citation for this as a journal article. So this is a talk about Andrew Wakefield, who was a gastroenterologist. Him and his colleagues published a paper in The Lancet in 98, described eight children whose first symptoms appeared within one month after receiving an MMR vaccine. They all had the GI symptoms. They all had a hyperplasia. And he postulated that MMR causes intestinal inflammation that leads to peptides to the brain where it affects bloodstream except he manipulated his data, which came out in the five years after that. And then within the five years after that, he lost his medical license. Don't mess with your data and then publish a really high profile paper about it. If you're gonna mess with your data, publish a really low profile paper and then you get away with it. Not that I'm advocating this. But you know, this is one of the most high profile cases of scientific fraud in our generation because you ended up with a lot of people who have popularity or fame latching onto this and believing that it was the truth even when it was simply a poor scientific study with no statistical power and manipulated data. Turned out what he did is he had eight children but he started with about 15. He dropped the ones that didn't fit his criteria, got it down to the eight who all had the same criteria and then published it. And you know, I can do the same thing. I can take my data set and I can drop all the people who don't agree with my hypothesis and then my data set agrees with my hypothesis. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, it's also fraud, so it's bad. Uh, yes and no. He did believe, so experimental bias. This, he, he believed that this was a possibility. I mean, he was the one who wrote this whole causal link, how it could possibly work. And he, so he was predisposed to looking for that, but he also he committed fraud. That's, that's well beyond one of the biases or the errors. And that's just genuinely going, well, that data point doesn't fit, throw it out. That data point doesn't fit, throw it out until it fits what you want it to fit. And then, of course, you try and publish it. Which, I mean, it got him a lot of fame, but maybe not the kind of fame you want. So, this is a comic I read every day called Saturday Morning Breakfast Cereal. The guy is snarky, but very scientific, very statistically often has these things. And this is, uh, he came up two weeks ago, and it made me think of it for today, it's like autism spectrum people are overrepresented in research science. We all know really awkward physicists, right? People in physics, people in stats. 
Autism causes vaccines, not the other way around. Causal links are hard. We can't say that vaccines cause autism, not unless you can demonstrate beyond a, any sort of doubt what the causal pathway is. You can say they're associated, but they're not. We've disproved that with more and more studies. So it's sort of funny to flip it around and say, wait a minute, no, it's the other way around. Autism is trying to cure itself through vaccines. Anyway, it's just a comic, doesn't mean anything much. One last example to wrap up the day. The Pew Foundation did a nationwide US telephone survey, asked 2,625 adults, 18 and older, whether they believe that there is only one true love for each person. Do you agree? And here's the results. We have the male results, agreeing, disagreeing, and don't know. We have the female results, agreeing, disagreeing, and don't know. So what proportion of the males agree with this statement? So to do this, we would take 372, which is the ones who agree, and we would divide that by 372 plus 807 plus 34. That's the proportion that agree. Similarly, we could do the same thing with the females. We would take 363 and we would divide it by 363 plus 1005 plus 44. And that would give us our proportions of males agreeing and females agreeing. And then we say, is there a difference in attitude on this subject between males and females across the entire population? Which we randomly sampled these people so we can generalize the population that they came from. And so we want to do a test to see if there's a difference in attitudes between the categories. This is a test for independence. It's one survey categorized then into genders. Our null hypothesis, the attitude is not associated with gender. The alternative hypothesis is attitude is associated with gender. So. Let's copy these over, 372-807-34. And copy these over, 363-1005-44. What is the first thing that we have to do? We need the totals. You always, if you're not given them, you have to compute the row and the column totals. So if we grab out a calculator, away we go. 372 plus 363 is 700. Actually, I'll switch colors for this. Blue. 735. And this is 1,812. And this is 78. And now we go down the columns, 372 plus 807 plus 34. And then 363 plus 1005 plus 44. That gets us our row totals, our column totals. We need our grand total. To do the grand total, you don't have to add all the cells. Just work your way across or down the total totals. So it's 1213 plus 1412, which is 2625, which was indeed the thing that was told to us for the total number of survey participants. So we now have our full table. The next step is to compute all of our expected values in all of their tedium. And so you take each cell, and I'll switch colors again. Let's go with the beautiful purple. No, uh, purple's close to red. Green, we'll go with green. I take 735, and I multiply that by 1213, and then I divided that. So 735 times 1213 over 2625 is going to be 339.64. One down. Five to go. 360, sorry, 735 times 1412 
over 2625. 395.36. 1812 times 12, 13. 1812 times 1412. And then 78 times 12, 13. And 78 times 14, 12. This is why I recommend, at least for web work, do these as lines in R so that when you make a typo, because you are going to, you can find it and you can fix it. So we work our way through these. Yes, it's boring, but it's good practice. We end up with numbers like 41.96, 41, and then we get 78 times 1213 divided by 2625, which gives us 36.04, and then we get 1812 times 1213 divided by 2625. 837.3 and 1812 times 1412 divided by 2625, 974.7. Now that we've worked our way through that, we have to put them back into a table that's exactly the same size so we keep track of which one goes where. And then we would compute O minus E squared over E. So we're going to go back and forth between the next slide. Three thirty nine point sixty four. Three ninety five point thirty six. Eight thirty seven point three. 974.7, 41.96, and 36.04. And if we go back to our red color, let me just copy that out, 372, 363. 807 and then 1005, and 34 and 44. That's all the work for this problem, at least getting all the numbers set up, assuming I haven't made a typo, which I'm sure I probably have. At this point, now we have our observed and our expected. We have to put them together to get our chi-squared. And so now we take, this is observed, this is expected, and so our computation is 372 minus 339.64, square that, divide by 339.64, plus 363 minus 395.36, over 395.36. I'm done. Chi squared test statistic is 7.98 through the power of magic. And that is a p value of 0 0.018. Therefore, we do have evidence at a 0.05 level to conclude that there's a relationship between gender and opinions about the existence of the one true love. We don't know what that difference is. So that's the end of the theory for the exam. We are doing another class on review and simulation next week. And then week 12 is a review week for the final. Have a great night.